A few months after being discharged from the army at the end of World War I, a 20-year-old C.S. Lewis published his first book, a cycle of poems titled Spirits in Bondage. The opening poem, Satan Speaks, provided a grim portrait of nature that might startle many of Lewis's later readers. I am nature, the mighty mother. I am the law, ye have none other. I am the flower and the dewdrop fresh. I am the lust in your itching flesh. I am the battle's filth and strain. I am the widow's empty pain. I am the sea to smother your breath. I am the bomb, the falling death. I am the spider making her net. I am the beast with jaws blood wet. Lewis's passionate, even angry atheism during his early years was inspired by what he referred to as the argument from undesign. The idea that nature's cruelty and waste supplies the best evidence against a belief in a benevolent creator. Lewis's attraction to the argument from undesign reflected personal tragedies such as his mother's death during his childhood. But it also showed the impact of writers like H.G. Wells, who nourished the young Lewis's imagination with depictions of a universe that was vast, cold and impersonal. Even after Lewis accepted Christianity, the argument from undesign made him skeptical of some traditional arguments for the Christian God based on the intelligent design of nature. Lewis never thought that the evidence for intelligent design alone could get you to believe in a Christian God. And in that way, he was similar to many modern intelligent design theorists who think that the evidence for intelligent design is important in defeating materialism and can actually help you understand that there is a need for a transcendent intelligent cause. But determining whether that cause is God uh, or what other attributes he may have uh, goes beyond just the scientific evidence and requires evidence from philosophy and history and other forms of argument. And so Lewis, although he appreciated intelligent design, always thought that it was a more limited argument, and in that way he anticipated many of the arguments of uh, current intelligent design theorists. Despite Lewis's skepticism of some arguments for God's existence based on intelligent design, he ended up offering several positive arguments supportive of intelligent design in nature. The story of how Lewis went from believing and being convinced by the argument from undesign to understanding that the universe displayed evidence of intelligent design is really intriguing. It basically is the story of how Lewis had to confront evidence throughout nature and the human world that really didn't fit with the materialist worldview. And that evidence ultimately persuaded him that there needed to be something more than materialism and really brought him to the belief that there really was design in the universe. Lewis's first argument, supportive of intelligent design, was the argument from natural beauty. From early on, Lewis's pessimistic view of nature as cruel and wasteful was balanced by the longings nature stirred within him. For Lewis, our experience of beauty in nature pointed to the reality of something beyond nature. Atoms dead could never thus stir the human heart of us, unless the beauty that we see, the veil of endless beauty be. In Lewis's view, the longings provoked by earthly beauty could not be accounted for by a blind and mechanical universe. They required a transcendent cause outside of nature. This cause was not necessarily personal, but it did go beyond undirected matter and energy. As a consequence, it put intelligent design back on the table as one of the options for discussion. Lewis's second argument, supportive of intelligent design, was the argument from morality. It was really the moral law that got Lewis thinking about how the argument from undesign ultimately was unsatisfactory. Because if we really think that the universe is evil or, or that it's cruel, uh, where do we get that standard from? If the universe is just what it is, and it just is uh, put together because of blind matter and motion, it couldn't be anything else, then where do we get off expressing outrage at it? Uh, it's just the way it is. So if we really think that there is a moral right and wrong, as most people do, and we want to hold to that belief, 
we really have to come up with some explanation other than blind matter in motion. In fact, the moral law, Lewis thought, pointed towards the need for a transcendent cause for morality. And that transcendent cause for morality opens the door to considering intelligent design as the explanation for morality. Lewis's third argument, supportive of intelligent design, was the argument from reason. The argument from reason is just the argument that in a naturalistic worldview, reason isn't going to fit. Because in the last analysis, everybody's thoughts are going to be the result of non-rational causes. You're basically trying to say that human reasoning, the very kind of reasoning that produced the origin of species, that produced Einstein's theory of relativity, that adds, subtracts, divides numbers and so forth. What you're saying is all of that is ultimately the product of irrational causes, non-rational causes. That is an incoherent position. Okay, because it says that somehow you can derive intelligence from that which is not intelligent. Lewis's fourth argument, supportive of intelligent design, was the argument from functional complexity. According to Lewis, modern science, especially Darwinian biology, has schooled us to think that crude and simple things in nature naturally develop into more complex and sophisticated things. The acorn turns into the oak tree. The egg turns into the owl. The human embryo turns into a full-fledged human being. Sometimes evolutionists even point to technological development as an example of this same process. The early locomotive engine supposedly evolved into the much more complicated modern train engine. Or the simple boat evolved into the steamship or passenger ship. Lewis called this evolutionary view an optical illusion. What we really see in nature, according to Lewis, is simpler and less functional things habitually springing from things that are more complex and functional. If anything, it's a process of devolution, not evolution. Every acorn originally drops from a fully developed oak tree. Every owl's egg comes from a fully developed owl. Every human embryo requires two fully developed human parents. The same is true with technological evolution. The modern train engine didn't simply magically evolve from a simpler train engine, according to Lewis. It sprang from something far greater, the mind of man. And Lewis thought that just like we have to go outside the physical sequence of train engines to find the originator of the engines, we need to go outside the ordinary course of nature to find the originator of nature, the intelligent designer. Lewis's argument from functional complexity is an explicit argument for intelligent design. Lewis's argument from functional complexity was based on his belief that an effect could not be greater than its original cause. Put another way, a copy could not be better than the original. This was a platonic idea that Lewis found in medieval writers, such as Bohethius. I think his most consistent argument was uh, the argument from the copy and the original. You see it in fiction, non-fiction, all over the place. And he argues there that if we consider the source of uh, an idea, it's not possible for the idea to contain more information than could be found in the sum of its causes. Lewis, in an informal way, seems to have uh, anticipated some of the ideas of, uh, of Bill Dembski here because, you know, Bill Dembski has, has published uh, many, many works that support the idea that um, you really can't get new information out of undirected causes. You have to go to some intelligent source and uh, Lewis's various versions of this argument from the copy and the, and the original always take you back to some source that already contained uh, information. In addition to making his own positive arguments for intelligent design, Lewis answered some common objections to intelligent design, such as the idea that it's an obstacle to scientific progress. It's commonly argued that intelligent design is a science stopper. But C.S. Lewis pointed out that he thought it was a science starter. According to Lewis, early scientists looked for regularities and laws in nature because they thought there was a legislator behind nature. 
far from frustrating the progress of science, the belief in design helped inspire it. According to Lewis, the fact that many modern scientists reject intelligent design is what should concern us. If they no longer believe in the lawgiver behind nature, why should they continue to expect nature to act reasonably or to be able to find uh, regularities in nature? Another objection to intelligent design answered by Lewis was the idea that the laws of nature make design unnecessary. Sometimes people argue that the laws of nature can create highly complex biological features without the need for intelligent design. But Lewis pointed out that the laws of nature can't do anything themselves. They require input from outside. The laws of motion don't make the billiard balls move. It's the player with the cue who hits the ball that makes the balls move. The laws of nature describe what will happen given certain inputs, but they don't explain away the need for the inputs in the first place. Perhaps C.S. Lewis's greatest contribution to the debate over intelligent design was his support for open discussion and debate. I don't think most people really realize how dedicated Lewis was to the idea of open inquiry and free debate in his own life. In fact, uh, while he was at Oxford University, he helped found a group called the Oxford Socratic Club, whose reason for existence was to debate the merits and the evidence for Christianity. They met every week, and uh, lots of students went to it, and faculty, and they hashed out the arguments pro and con, and they adopted as their motto an injunction from Socrates that we should follow the argument wherever it leads. And it was before this group that a young graduate student presented a paper eloquently arguing for atheism. That student went on to become one of the world's leading academic atheists. His name was Anthony Flew. Flew was never convinced by Lewis's arguments for theism, but he admired C.S. Lewis, and especially Lewis's dedication to following the argument where it leads. And he adopted that motto as his own motto. So much so that near the end of his life, Anthony Flew shocked many of his colleagues and people around the world by declaring that uh, he thought the evidence now showed that there was a God. He had followed the argument where it led, and it led him to belief in God. And what was really determinative of that was some of the arguments for intelligent design. The integrated complexity of the organic world is just inordinately greater you know, all the, the creatures um, uh, are complicated uh, pieces of design. Just like Lewis, Flew had followed the argument where it led, and it led him to intelligent design. In an age of increasing dogmatism in the name of science, C.S. Lewis's defense of the unhindered search for truth is just as relevant for us today as it was during his own lifetime, maybe even more so. As Lewis knew, it's by continuing to pursue the argument that we can discover new worlds, explore new wonders, and grasp new truths. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah.